Yeah, I'm admitting all, madam. Okay, sure, sure. Hello. 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 Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah. Um, Dr. Deepa, you want to um, tell, um, you know, uh, some uh, quick rules about um, turning off the mic and others? Yes, ma'am. Do you want to tell uh, the quick rules on turning off the mic and others? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, requesting all participants to mute your phone, uh, mute your uh, speakers, and uh, and uh, you will be allowed to ch chat with the host and raise a question to them. So you'll not be able to. Your uh, you cannot share the screen. And oh. if you have any questions, you can post it to the host. Ma'am, good afternoon. This is Doctor Anand. As a host, you can directly mute all the participants, ma'am. Yeah, and open, yeah. And also uh, we, to uh, stop the share of the screen, ma'am. That's the thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, is... that will be good, I think so. Uh, thanks, Anand. Anand, we want the uh, participant to understand it, and then we are uh, doing it, Anand. Fine, ma'am. Thanks, ma'am. OK. Yeah. <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. Are you able yeah, to hear me? Yeah, good afternoon. Yes? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Dr. Anshuman. So um, we start the webinar now. And so um, welcome to the webinar and uh, welcome to IHMR. Are you all able to see the screen? Yes. So uh, we're very happy to host and uh, Yes, ma'am, we can proceed. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> yeah, can you um, unmute me, Arun? You are unmuted, ma'am. You are. We can hear. You can hear me. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So uh, <clears throat> welcome to the seminar on decoding novel coronavirus genome to conquer COVID. 19. Uh, I'm Usha Manjunath, and I will briefly say, take about a minute to say who we are. Uh, IHMR Bangalore, Institute of Health Management Research, the South Campus at Bangalore, is an electronic city. And uh, we work in the three key domain areas, education, uh, which is equivalent to the PGDM, is equivalent to an MBA, as given by AIU in hospital and health management. 
and uh, we have three specializations currently uh, health hospital management and health it management this year we will introduce pharmaceutical management we also carry out a lot of research projects funded by government state central national and international agencies ngos and uh, csr and so on uh, we conduct training programs and mdps um, also we take up healthcare management and nabh consultancy program so that's briefly about us and um, covid 19 pandemic who has not heard about it so this has taken precedence um, from january onwards though it started slow in march for us it became real in india and it has practically impacted everyone on this earth people water air sky air, you name it it has impacted us quite a bit we have known all aspects of you know various things how to take care how to prevent you know the lockdown all aspects are going on um, it's also about science and research there's a lot of uh, projects that are going on for vaccine development antiviral drug or plasma therapy trials new diagnostic tests rapid tests and so on as we all looked at this pandemic i also look back on um, the previous pandemic almost a century back the spanish flu pandemic in uh, 1918 to 1920 which affected 500 million people and killed nearly 20 million some people put the number of the people who died to 50 million some even have put it to 100 million um, as i was examining closely on to this particularly on the genome of the novel coronavirus i also happened to read a bit of work of Dr. Frederick Griffith, a medical officer, a bacteriologist at the British Ministry of Health. His experiments, he found unwittingly launched the molecular biology revolution. His experiment was the most definitive demonstration that the gene was a chemical. Then, of course, lots of studies with molecular biology and genetics um, came the genome um, you know, studies. Um, genome, as we all know, is the genetic material of an organism, name coined by Hans Winkler, 1920, uh, University of Hamburg, Germany. And uh, then many of us have heard about and known, or maybe many of you are working probably in the Human Genome Project earlier, or maybe continue to work in various aspects of genome. So welcome to this again. And um, I have just put the broad numbers. Um, as on 23rd April, and I don't think I want to read it out. Um, all of us are seeing it in the newspapers, the media, um, you know, on our WhatsApp, on the um, mobile phones and everywhere. Um, so this has really, really affected a large number of people. And, um, you know, conquer COVID-19. Uh, we will conquer, for sure, but when? or how is a big question. So continuing to look at this novel coronavirus genome, uh, this webinar is launched. And uh, so now I'm going to introduce the speakers. Um, Dr. Shivdar Gupta, Chairman, IHMR University, President also of the WHO Sefian. Welcome, sir. I will introduce you, sir, Dr. S.D. Gupta is a leading public health professional with a distinguished academic and research career. He obtained his MD, Preventive and Social Medicine from India, and PhD in Epidemiology from Johns Hopkins University, Baltimore, USA. He was conferred Fellowship of Academy of Medical Science, India, FAMS, for his outstanding contribution in the field of public health. He has done pioneering work of creating and establishing new discipline of health management. That is where we are all working now at IHMR Group, promoting research in health policy and health system and programs. Dr. Gupta is an adjunct professor at the Johns Hopkins University, USA, 
and visiting professor at University of Chester, UK. He is the president of WHO CRO, Sefian. Dr. Gupta also has served as an advisor to CRO WHO on several consultation processes. He was member of the technical review panel of the Global Fund. Dr. Gupta is the member of several research advisory committees of ICMR and chairs project review committee of Department of Health Research, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India. I'm sure I can go on telling about him, but at present we are also getting to know, learn and hear about COVID itself. And he is in the middle of this action currently. He is a member of task force for COVID-19 for government of Rajasthan. Welcome you, sir. I will now you, introduce. You, yes, sir. Welcome, welcome. And uh, now I will introduce Dr. Anshuman Sirda. Uh, he is our colleague at Daichama University. He is an assistant professor and uh, genetic epidemiology fellow at Mount Sinai Hospital, New York. Uh, he is working as a professor, assistant professor, and co-research committee member. Dr. Anshuman obtained his BDS degree from Government Dental College and Hospital at Mumbai and completed his MPH and PhD degrees in epidemiology from the University of Texas School of Public Health, Houston, Texas, USA. He worked as a genetic researcher at various institutions, including the MD Anderson Cancer Center and Human Genetic Center of the University of Texas Health Science Center, Houston. He has also worked in several multi-center and uh, international research projects, including the atherosclerosis risk community study, pediatric cardiac genomics consortium, national birth defects prevention study, craniosynostrosis network consortium, and CNICS HIV genetics project. Welcome, Dr. Anshuman. Thank you, Dr. Manjanath. Hello, everyone. Yes, um, he is young, he is, um, you know, very uh, passionate. He has done a lot of research work in this area and we welcome and we, uh, we will have his talk um, after Dr. SDG's introduction. Just to introduce everyone to the format of the webinar, introduction and welcome, I have already done. Um, then um, Dr. S.D. Gupta, sir, I welcome him to set the context and moderate the webinar. And of course, Dr. Anshuman will present on the decoding of Enterona genome. And um, there will be question and answers in the end. Um, I would be um, you know, taking the questions and posing it to um, both of them and they will be answering it. And I'm also very uh, happy to welcome Dr. Deepa Shri, uh, Pradeep Ji, our assistant professors, and uh, Arun Kumar, our system admin, who will be supporting us throughout this uh, webinar. And again, I'll come back for a minute to conclude and uh, thank you all. So it's wonderful um, to have you all um, for this program. And uh, sir, um, it's now over to you, sir. Can you put my slides? Yes, Arun uh, will uh, share the slides, sir. Okay, meanwhile, uh, let me thank you for inviting me to speak in this very important webinar. Uh, and I also welcome all those who are attending this webinar with great interest. We really got a lot of uh, questions in this particular webinar. And the topic of this uh, uh, webinar is very interesting because nobody is talking about that area that is of genomics. Being a public health professional and associated with um, prevention and control of uh, COVID pandemic in the state of Rajasthan as a member of advisory group and also a member of the task force for lockdown exit. Um, I really have a very handy experience of advising and getting the access to the data. So I'll be very happy to share with you what is happening around. Uh, as you know, this is uh, never before such a threat to humanity has come across. 
what COVID-19 has caused. And now it has assumed the uh, dimensions of a pandemic. Hardly any country is left out from the infection of COVID-19 as of today. What I'm going to do is uh, I'd like to share with you the global scenario of COVID-19 and then the scenario in India and its journey uh, to India from Wuhan. And then my colleague uh, Anshuman Sevda will speak more on character structure and genomics of this virus. And I'm going to, being a public health professional, my interest is much more of course, in the genomics, it's very recent because uh, my big question these days is there are two questions I've been asking people or people ask me. They ask me the, the, the virus that we have in India is same as that of what started with China and moved to Europe and then to US. And the second question that comes now across, which I confront, is about rapid testing kits. How accurate they are and shall we recommend these and why these kits are. So we will take up these questions later, but uh, Dr. Sevda will talk about um, the structure and genomics. I've been asking him this question, is it the same virus? Is there any change in the antigenic character of this virus or genomic D, uh, uh, DNA sequences during its journey from China to India? The reason for asking this question is because what we see in India, the infection level is very low still, despite being a huge population of 1.32 billion. The infection rate is still very low, fortunately, and the, the death rates are also very low compared to Europe and China. So I will speak on uh, how does it spread and what measures uh, to contain and, and prevent the spread of the disease. Uh, so this is, uh, this is some outline. Uh, can you move forward? And we have next slide. So this is what exactly I was telling you. This is my friend, uh, Dr. Anshuman Sevra will talk, but I just wanted to show the structure, the biggest enemy of mankind in the 21st century. I, I believe and don't think that any such threat will be posed by anything in this particular century in the coming time. We are still left with more years. And such a threat we are facing, um, it's really humongous and tremendous. So this virus, as you see it, so I'll, I'm leaving this slide for uh, Anshuma. Next, please. So this is a single strand RNA virus. And we know this virus for last 70 years. It had come, it's a, it belongs to the family of SARS. And... Uh, uh, it had come to the world and, uh, uh, in the form of SARS in 2003. And, but uh, it was not as severe as it is because it is highly contagious. And it is, uh, the incubation period is uh, also short compared to other viral diseases. So it spreads through contact transmission. You all know physical contact and droplets and it enters through mucous membrane of mouth, nose, and eyes. And it may also transmit through direct respiratory tract if you are in the vicinity within three feet of an infected person and he's coughing and sneezing. The droplet may settle directly on your mucosa or conjunctiva of eye or your mouth, on the face, uh, like nose. So that's what you may um, but that is a very rare because uh, <clears throat> if you are using mask and others, the, the, the patient or the case is also using mask, the transmission through respiratory route is uh, just not uh, 
it's not common, I would like to say. So next, please. So as I said, incubation period is about two to 14 days with a median of six days. And uh, what I have seen, uh, I, I would like to tell you that I am dealing with the one of the hot spots in India, that is Ramganj area in Jaipur, where 80% uh, of the cases of Pakistan are uh, found. And uh, what we find uh, with the uh, investigations did RT-PCR in the community over, I think, about 1,100 samples. And we found 80% of the cases were asymptomatic. And <laughs> a new learning for us, because earlier we believed 30%, 40% cases may be asymptomatic. But what we found that uh, uh, majority of the cases are asymptomatic and it's difficult. And from public health point of view, this is very serious and dangerous uh, to have asymptomatic in the country. Now, uh, you all know the symptoms of this fever, cough, and body being headache. And uh, this infection may pass for cases in asymptomatic or mild cases but may require hospitalization and severe disease. What we have found uh, from our experience in current uh, COVID epidemic, uh, only one or 2% of the patients require hospitalization and not, but till date we have not put anybody in ICU. Till date. So uh, they may require hospitalization, but None of the keys in Jaipur, the biggest hospital of Rajasthan and one of the largest in India. Um, so we have not put any case in ICU till so far. And then if you find such, then important thing is report immediately. Next, please. Next, next. Next slide. Okay, you, you all know there is no treatment, though we are talking about many medicines. We are trying to use our old medicines used for malaria and HIV. So there are some reports, but these are more clinical experiences. People, the clinicians, the specialists say hydroxychloroquine and one or two HIV retroviral drugs are useful in reducing the severity of uh, illness as well as uh, early recovery from the disease. So, and there is no vaccine. It will take time. Already one lab in UK is, has, is going to start human uh, clinical trials in England. And there are three, four more uh, universities in, in various countries who are about to start their trials. Still, even if we find a vaccine, we will not be able to get a vaccine in next 10 to 12 months on the commercial level. So in the market, it's not likely to be available so soon. So what we are left with, we are left with only prevention of the spread and protection of self. So don't go out, that is, what we are all are under lockdown. So respect this lockdown. <laughs> Be in home and find yourself in home. Practice social distancing. Go hand washing and soap water with soap and water or hand sanitizers. Use mask or clothes to cover face. Don't touch your face again and again, other, other objects. And importantly, sanitize your home by 1% hypochlorite solution. Next week. Now this is sort of the global scenario. Till today, uh, about 2.6 million cases have occurred and almost 25% or so have uh, recovered or cured. Uh, global average of deaths is around 6.8%. So this fatality uh, is uh, really high, 6.8%. 
And incidentally, the, the, when the infection traveled from China to Europe and to US, so China has been, with all question marks, has successfully controlled the epidemic in that country. But what has happened now, the Europe, the entire <laughs> Union, and now US. So first the epicenter became this uh, Europe, especially Italy to begin with, and then Spain, France, and UK. Finally, it landed up in US. It had landed up in the US early, but nobody really took cognizance of the seriousness of COVID infection. So today, US is the most affected country. And the death rates is as high as 5.6%. But if you see the, the other four countries which are mentioned here, the mortality rates are very high. Spain 10.5%, Italy 13.4%, France 13.3%, and UK 13.5%. So they have the largest number of the cases, but most countries in the European Union are affected. And uh, practically no country is spared by Corona. And people ask me what is next, how long it's going to go. I think it's going to live with us for next two to three months, at least in its form, what we are facing today. And uh, we'll have to learn social distancing and change our styles to deal with this corona infection. And what is the next destination? It has already started showing that the next epicenter is likely to be Africa, unless we begin with lockdown and social distancing and take appropriate measures and restrictions for travel in those countries are put into place. Then Africa, it will be a wildfire. So the mortality rate are likely to be very high if this, this goes to Africa. Next, please. Now, let me tell you something about India. Now, till this time when we are talking, the total, it's a very dynamic situation, but it's still uh, what the last update was around 21,797 cases have been reported. One thing to note is the death rates. So we have number of cases very low. In India, it entered in January 3rd, on January 30th. And see, India was very smart. Our response to COVID-19 was really very strong and early in time. And perhaps because of that, we have low number of cases. Now, and the, the government started preparing for this uh, pandemic. And if you compare the death rates in India is only 3.1% compared to 6% 6 in US and 10% plus in the European countries. Now we need to really find out why the death rates are really low. It's a, hypothesis to work on. More males are affected, high mortality in elderly in Europe and US. And what we have seen, the mortality rates are higher in middle-aged people between 14, 40 to 60 years of age. And uh, more is still seen in the urban areas. We have still the rural penetration is not uh, reported. There may be some but uh, still it is localized in the urban areas of different cities. Uh, uh, you can see which are in this map, this dark uh, brown color is Maharashtra, which is most affected and is the epicenter in India. Most deaths have occurred in Maharashtra and most deaths in Maharashtra have occurred in Mumbai. You might have listened to Dharavi's stories and uh, outbreaks in Pune. And then uh, Gujarat, which was very low in infection, has jumped to number two after Maharashtra. And then we have Madhya Pradesh. They were low reporting uh, states. Now they have come on to first four 
of the states, Rajasthan is also one of those where we see large number of the cases. A success story that you can see, Kerala was one where this infection was spreading like anything, but Kerala controlled it very effectively. In Rajasthan, we also saw, you might have heard about Bhilwada model, um, where in one day, Bhilwada district contributed half the cases in the country. That was the situation, but it is contained now. And for 13 days, there was no report of new cases in this particular district. We'll, we may talk about this later, what is this model, but it is doable. We can prevent the spread. We can contain the disease if the health system's response is strong and resilient. Okay, next, please. Now, this is about the important timelines and the journey of this particular pandemic started reported, I would say it was reported first. Uh, case in Wuhan in China on December, on December 31st. And uh, it is said that it started somewhere in November in China, but and even before. But China reported it only in the second week of January and uh, viral genome. And then first case outside China and first case in India came in Kerala on January 30. And these are medical students who came from Wuhan. They were studying over there. And then two more cases uh, in the first two weeks of February. So then um, there's a lot of tourist traffic in Jaipur and Delhi, and they tested positive, especially Italian tourists. And then there's religious congregation has really uh, speeded up the spread of the virus in different states in this country. So Prime Minister Modi announced lockdown on March 24, effective from March 25. And then India has now been, of course, uh, in, in the beginning there were very small number of cases, but now it has gone up to 21,000. It's still, uh, the government is uh, reporting that the spread is slowed down, but we cannot be complacent. And you know, the lockdown two has been extended until May 3. I'm part of uh, the task force on lockdown exit strategies. And uh, uh, the, the Prime Minister had video conferencing with the various states. It's important that where there is low intensity or no cases, because this COVID has very huge implications on economy and livelihood in this country. So some economy, economic activities need to be initiated. You know about the mass exodus of laborers and that really created a very panicky situation around the country. Next, please. Uh, next. Uh, all right, well, I think let's just skip the slide. So what public health measures we are doing, taking? One is uh, very important, which uh, um, should have come first is uh, uh, hospital preparedness. To prepare our hospitals for uh, admitting COVID patients, it's a very different thing. So we have to have dedicated wards or dedicated hospitals only for treatment, isolation and treatment of the patients. And then we need to prepare our ICUs and uh, all those measures which are necessary for uh, containment of the spread. And then uh, from public health point of view, testing is the key. And incidentally, testing in India has not picked up. So if this is 6,000 testing in per million in US or Europe, it is only around 300 uh, tests per million population in our country. 
but testing is the key to identify cases and uh, isolate them and track or trace the contacts, put them in quarantine and uh, continue to follow them up for the symptoms and uh, maybe you can test. We are testing in Rajasthan all quarantined people. We have to create quarantine facilities and uh, keep them at least uh, for 14 days. That is the longest incubation period. So the states have announced uh, two incubation periods, that is 28 days quarantine. It's important to do testing of contacts and very importantly, continued surveillance and monitoring. Now, these are some of the measures which are so important um, for containing the spread of the virus. Uh, we have largely succeeded, but all said and done, the number of the cases of COVID are rising in our country. I'm quite hopeful that it will not go to the extent of what is happening in Europe or in US. Uh, in India, this should be an early decline and significant decline in uh, next uh, four to six weeks. So continued surveillance is very important. We are using uh, RT-PCR for diagnostic confirmation. And also we plan to do rapid testing for zero surveillance. But, you know, we didn't find that uh, our microbiologists had some doubts whether they, we should use. So this is put on hold by the ICMR so long. But on our, what is very, very important, since we don't have treatment, we don't have vaccine, only thing is distancing, social distancing. And this is what the lockdown is meant for. It has been estimated by putting the lockdown early, India has saved itself from a wild spread of the virus. We would have had at least eight lakh cases had we not put the lockdown in place. And uh, since the prime minister and the government of India saw that there is a rise in cases, so this lockdown has been extended. So this is very crucial. The social distancing is very, very crucial for averting the um, hand washing at the individual level, covering mouth and nose with mask and cloth, and sanitizing the area with disinfectant is very, very important. Next, please. I like to summarize this uh, finally. So to prevent the spread, keep social distancing, frequent hand washing, keep your mouth and nose covered, Keep your home clean with the hypochlorite solution. Keep neighborhood clean. Next, please. Next. Next, please. Next, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I have many other slides, but I'll main theme today is genomics. So I'll now invite Dr. Sivda to come on and share with you. Very interesting and exciting. Uh, data that he has and a great understanding. He is a, a expert in genetic epidemiology. Uh, I, I hope he will be able to share with you the latest in genomics of COVID virus. And maybe he answers is the same virus or not. Thank you. Okay. Um, over to you. Thank you, sir. Over to you, Dr. Anshuman. Thank you, Dr. S. D. Gupta, and thank you, Dr. Manjunath, uh, for uh, such a nice introduction uh, and for a very insightful overview of the situation and the coronavirus. And uh, can I share my screen now? Uh, uh, okay, thank you. All right, so in the interest of time, I'll get started right away. All right. Yeah. You can see the slide. Okay. Yes, we can see you. Yeah, go ahead. All right. So good afternoon, everyone. So let's get right into it. I'll talk about the coronavirus and COVID-19 and the genetics of it. 
So genetics, as you know, it requires uh, some understanding of the molecular structure as well. And in case of viruses, we also need to know uh, the origin of the virus and the spread of it. So we need to identify various strains. For that, we need to do phylogenetic analysis. So I'll uh, step into it one by one. First of all, the taxonomic classification of coronavirus. So virus, viral classification is not that uh, complete as uh, classification of other life forms, uh, mostly because it is not considered living by uh, some ideas of what life should be. But riboviria is quite well understood, relatively well understood. So uh, RNA viruses, all RNA viruses and virioids uh, that depend on RNA for their replication and for infecting the host, they are in the realm of called, something called riboviria. Within riboviria, we have the nidoviralis. Within nidoviralis, we have all the viruses that are positive, positive sense single strand RNA viruses. They have animal and human hosts. And uh, within nidoviralis, the coronavirus that we are dealing with uh, is within the family of coronaviridae or subfamily orthocoronavirinae, uh, which that has four uh, genera, genera uh, called alpha coronavirus, beta coronavirus, delta coronavirus, and gamma coronavirus. Alpha and beta coronavirus gen uh, genera are the ones where we have uh, viruses that infect uh, birds and mammals. Beta coronavirus is the one that has sarbecovirus lineage or uh, subgenus. Uh, that has SARS coronavirus that caused the 2003 epidemic, as well as SARS coronavirus 2, SARS CoV 2, the current COVID 19 epidemic culprit. So far, we have identified six coronaviruses that are pathogenic uh, in humans. Two of them are alpha coronaviruses, uh, but they have, uh, they have mild respiratory tract infections. And four are beta coronaviruses. They cause symptoms like pneumonia. Uh, uh, some of them are uh, uh, highly fatal. For example, the SARS epidemic from 2003 caused by SARS coronavirus and MERS uh, coronavirus from the Middle East that had a 37% mortality rate. It was back in 2012. So after these six coronaviruses, now we have the seventh one, which is uh, SARS-CoV-2. All coronaviruses have uh, RNA uh, and the coronavirus uh, family has the la largest it's the largest uh, RNA virus among all RNA viruses. They all have multiple open reading frames that code for several polyproteins. The first open reading frame uh, comprises almost 67% of the entire viral genome and encodes for several non-structural proteins up to 16. Remaining third of the RNA genome encodes accessory and structural proteins. We'll talk in detail about all of them later. Now, SARS coronavirus and SARS coronavirus 2 uh, from 2003 and from 2020, they have similarities. As I mentioned, they in taxonomic classification, they are very close to each other. They are both in lineage B. Both are positive sense uh, single strand RNA uh, viruses. Uh, both are enveloped, have spike like structure on the outside. Genome is of similar size, almost 30 kilo bases, uh, 30,000 bases. There are certain protein differences, however, and uh, uh, there are several other changes that we are, differences that we are exploring, and uh, those changes have resulted in significant difference in their virulence and infectiousness. So, for example, uh, protein 3B in SARS coronavirus has 154 amino acids, whereas in SARS CoV 2, it only has 22 amino acids. 8A protein is present in SARS coronavirus from 2003. However, it's absent in the current coronavirus. Similarly, 8B protein is smaller in the older uh, coronavirus and larger in the current coronavirus. Now, SARS, uh, moving on to SARS coronavirus 2 genome, as I mentioned, positive sense, single stranded RNA of 30 kilo bases. It encodes for 27 proteins. Going from 5N terminus to the 3N terminus uh, on the RNA genome, uh, there is uh, ORF1AB and ORF1A genes that encode for polyprotein 1AB and 1A. Uh, this is the uh, first 71% of the entire SARS-CoV-2 RNA genome. These proteins uh, comprise 15 non-structural proteins, including NSP1 to, through NSP10 and NSP12 through NSP16. 
Now these non-structural proteins play some specific role in the virulence of these viruses. So I'll discuss that uh, in a little bit. Now they, uh, some of these NSPs, non-structural proteins, help encode the replication transcription complex. Now this complex is necessary for the virus once it enters the host. It helps the virus to replicate, make copies of itself in the infected host cell. Now rest, uh, replication transcription complex uh, does that by making several copy, uh, copies of uh, genomic RNA as well as subgenomic RNAs through a process called discontinuous transcription, where the stretch of the RNA that encodes for these proteins uh, makes smaller copies of uh, uh, RNAs that can be translated into these non-structural proteins. If we look at the three end terminus of the genome, we have four main structural proteins, a spike uh, glycoprotein, envelope, membrane protein, and nucleocapsid phosphoprotein as well as there are several uh, accessory proteins listed here. Just, uh, just an overview of the layout of uh, how the genome looks. We can see the first open reading frame. The first main uh, gene uh, is ORF1AB, extending up to almost 21,000 uh, 21, bases. And then we have the structural protein and the uh, membrane protein, annular protein, and nucleocapsid. Within this uh, open reading frame I mentioned, this section of the genome has discontinuous transcription that forms these smaller non-structural proteins that play a role in the virus infectivity. This is just, if we just look at the Wuhan virus, uh, the very first Wuhan coronavirus that was reported, these are some of the details, uh, specific details of how uh, large uh, each gene is and what kind of proteins it encodes. Uh, this RNA genome also has untranslated regions on the 5N and 3N. As you know, the 3N protects uh, the RNA from degradation, and the 5N untranslated region has regulatory elements that control the transcription and translation of the coding sequence of the viral genome. Also, I would like to point out in this uh, structural proteins, the largest uh, region is allocated to surface glycoprotein here with 3,800 bases. Now, these non-structural proteins that I talked about, we'll move to structural huh? later. Let's uh, look at the non-structural protein first. OK, thank you. So uh, they help this virus evade the host immune system. They help it infect the host cell in a way that it can quickly hijack the machinery, take over the host cell nutrients and the replication machinery to make copies of itself. It uh, suppresses the immune response from that cell and quickly replicates with the help of these non-structural proteins. For example, NSP3. Uh, it is the largest non-structural protein. As I mentioned, it is, it is essential for component of replication transcription complex that makes several copies of the viral RNA. NSP1, it binds to the 40S subunit of human ribosomes and it inhibits or shuts off host cell translation function. It causes degradation of host mRNAs in the infected cell. So while it is hijacking and utilizing all the nutrients from the host cell, at the same time, it is debilitating that host cell, not letting it respond in an efficient manner to clear this virus or call for help from the immune response to kill it. So that is how it kind of extends its stay until it has replicated enough. And then the, by the time the cell is recognized by our immune system, we are, there are already several copies of this virus and it is infecting the unaffected cells. Now, uh, I won't go into detail of many of uh, like all of these. And as you know, like some of the functions are not known. Uh, these are smaller non-structural proteins. It's quite challenging to study them. So we know function kind of for some of them, but not all. Now, four major structured proteins, as I mentioned, uh, spike protein. These are surface glycoproteins here on the surface. They're very important immunogenic particles on the surface of this virus. They help coronavirus to attach itself to the host cell, recognize the binding site on certain host cells based on the certain receptors. Then we have the envelope protein that en encases the entire virus, a membrane glycoprotein, and the nucleocapsid phosphoprotein that encases the entire RNA material within itself. Just a comparison here, I won't go into details, but just a comparison of SARS coronavirus with the MERS coronavirus. Uh, we can see they have similar structure, uh, even the MERS coronavirus and SARS, open reading frames, structure spike protein, uh, envelope protein, membrane protein, nucleocapsid, a similar kind of structure. The second 
and the fourth row is more into detail of the spike protein that it has S1 subunit and S2 subunit. Looking at binding and entry into the host cell. Now both SARS coronavirus and SARS coronavirus 2, they both have strong affinity for the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 on host cells. Now several human cells have these receptors and as soon as virus recognizes those sites, it binds and it can infect those cells. It is, uh, SARS coronavirus is also activated by something called TMPRSS2. It's a serine protease enzyme. And this second enzyme, the first one helps bind the virus with the host cell, whereas the second, the serine protease enzyme, it helps it uh, split the spike protein and enter that host cell. So it facilitates the entry into the host cell. Uh, certain cells have these ACE2 receptor uh, on the surface. So uh, SARS coronavirus 2 can infect them. For example, pneumocytes, endothelial cell lining, myocardial cells, gut mucosal cells, renal tubular epithelial cells. Now these cells get infected. So these are the systems that are mainly targeted and infected and uh, diseased by this virus. Now this is just a 3D molecular structure here uh, of the spike protein, it was S1 and S2 subunit. And this is the conserved domain that binds with the ACE2 enzyme. Here is the 3D molecular structure of that receptor. Now, moving on after binding and entry to the host cell. Now, SARS coronavirus 2 has a receptor binding domain on the S1 unit of the spike glycoprotein that I showed on the previous slide, the 3D model. Now, this receptor binding domain binds with the host angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor and to gain entry it uses the TMP RSS2 enzyme. It primes the S protein that is it breaks the S1 and the S2 unit apart and so that's the serine protease enzyme the name protease so it catalyzes or accelerates the proteolysis or breakdown of the spike protein and that helps the virus in entry inside the host cell. Now after this proteolysis, it binds with the viral membrane, fuses with the host cell membrane, and through endocytosis, it enters the host cell. Now, both spike and nucleocapsid protein, I would like to point out at this point, that these are highly, spike protein and nucleocapsid protein, they're highly immunogenic structural proteins. That is the trigger a very high, significant immune response. If you look at all the proteins and structures in the virus, these two structures are the ones that trigger the most response. Although there will be some level of response by the non-structural proteins as well. Now, antibodies, antibodies in response to the spike and nucleocapsid protein play a crucial role in blocking viral entry because if you can block the spike protein, that structure that binds with the ACE2 receptor, if you can block that somehow, if you can target it, competitively inhibit it, or uh, uh, distort the structure in a way that it cannot bind anymore, the host cell won't get infected. It, helps uh, these proteins also help in opsonization where the immune system recognizes and coats it with the uh, protein machinery outside these particles that gets recognized by our host immune system and kind of triggers it and it calls for help and gets all the cells together, all the immune cells together and attacks that cell and causes effective phagocytosis. So these two proteins are uh, quite immunogenic and play a crucial role as a result the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 and TMPRSS2, both are important drug targets. We want to target them through drugs and either alter them or inhibit, the, inhibit their function or prevent their functioning, normal functioning in the virus. And several non-structural proteins, the smaller ones that debilitate the host cell and suppress the immune response, and especially you know, NSP12 and NSP3, certain non-structural proteins that I mentioned that help uh, the virus replicate inside the host cell, they are also very good targets for uh, uh, developing new drugs. Now, vaccines are used to trigger and prepare our antibody, uh, uh, our immune system, and create, generate a lot of antibody response that can prepare for future infection or reinfection. So for that, we have to target immunogenic proteins of the virus, viral particles. That means structures that trigger a strong immune response and also are effective targets to destroy the virus and uh, immune, immune system can control it. So S and N proteins are important for developing vaccine targets.
Now, just a brief uh, overview of how SARS coronavirus 2 enters, replicates, and gets released. So, as I mentioned, these are the ACE2 inhibitors. SARS coronavirus binds with them. Then, TMPRSS2 uh, helps cleave these S1 and S2 subunit. That facilitates binding with the host cell membrane. It gets engulfed inside through endocytosis and goes inside. As soon as it is inside, the outer layer is disintegrated and the entire viral genome mentioned here, the entire RNA of the virus is released in the cytoplasm. Now it hijacks the host ribosomes and quickly makes some of the essential elements that it needs to replicate itself. For example, this replicase or RDRP and translation into several smaller proteins that give rise to smaller non-structural proteins, NSP3, 4, and 6, for example, and the function we have already discussed. They attack the host immune response and cell behavior. Now, once uh, with they combine and form this replication transcription complex, that forms the entire genomic RNA, several copies of it, and all those copies will get encapsulated in individual new virus copies that are formed. In addition, through discontinuous transcription, it also makes several subgenomic RNA copies. Now, these fragments of smaller RNA that, is, that are formed from replication transcription complex, they form the structures that are needed to create a new virus. For example, the spike protein, nucleic acid, membrane, and envelope. All these elements, when they are produced, uh, genomic RNA and subgenomic RNA and the protein structures, they took, take the help of endoplasmic reticulum as a template and combine itself, it, uh, the entire RNA genome gets uh, wrapped with the help of nucleic acid and Golgi vesicle takes this new virus that is formed, it takes it to the cell surface and then through exocytosis, several copies of these viruses are released interstitially and to the neighboring cells to infect other cells. Now, looking at, as Dr. S. Gupta mentioned, we need to study the origin of these viruses. If we have to uh, make vaccines and have efficient drug targets, it's very important that we study the genome and the molecular structure of these viruses. For that, we do something called multiple sequence alignment. One second. For that, we do multiple sequence alignment where all the viruses, first we want to know how similar or how different this current strain of virus is from other viruses. And for that, we take all the species of coronaviruses and the sequences that we have, we align them, and we also align the novel coronavirus. What we see here is, as you can see, as they belong to the same family, most of these viruses have no variation in this region. It's A throughout. It's uh, G throughout in all species. So these are all the species names of different strains of coronaviruses. So this is what you do to identify that, okay, it is indeed a coronavirus. So you looked at conserved sites, you look at the sites that are common across several viruses, you know their structure, you know their function, what kind of structures they make, and that they make a new copy of coronavirus. However, we also need to distinguish one type of virus from the other. So we need to make sure that this virus that is infecting us, it's not a bad coronavirus with a small mutation and started infecting us and rest of it is the same. So we need to identify differences in the sequence. So when you align all the sequences, you see these kind of differences in the genome, right? So these are the ones that can help. These viruses are different from these because they are different at this site. Now, some of these changes are not significant if they are not coding for any protein, if they are at a location where they are not causing any change in the amino acids. So the result, the translation product is the same. So those, most of those mutations are not significant. However, some changes result in change in protein molecules. And they change them enough that it changes the behavior of the virus, the infectiousness of the virus. Uh, it changes the structure of the receptor in a way that earlier it was attaching to a bat cell, now it can attach to a human cell. So it, it can identify a receptor on the human cell. So those kind of mutations that change these protein structures in such a manner, they cause this jump from a bad coronavirus to human coronavirus. And that is what has happened in this case. So this is just a quick overview how it is done. So first three genome sequences from Wuhan were made public and they were studied. And as you can see at these sites, when you look at the first uh, RNA genome as a template, you look, there was a change at location 1023 
and the C nucleotide was changed to T, and that resulted in protein change uh, at NS for non-structural protein two. Now these kind of changes are important when you look at, but since it's affecting a non-structural protein two, the result might not be that significant. Similarly, here you see another allocation 20,670. Don't mind the difference in, these are two mutations, two different sites very close to each other. So they are like nine amino acids away. Hello? Yes, sir. Okay, you can. So, Go ahead. Can you. All right. so these are the kind of things you study, and then you need to run experiments in the lab to identify more functional role of these mutations. So you need to run functional studies to identify the significance of these changes. This is another way of looking at all sequences. So these are not sequences, but file names. Each of this, these files has the entire RNA genome of that species. So this is the kind of phylogenetic analysis you do. And then you look for genetic distance between two viruses. And closer they are on this phylogenetic plot, for example, these two viruses, they are evolutionarily and structurally and see, uh, in terms of genomic sequence, they are more similar to each other compared to say, for example, in this cluster, they are quite far apart from these viruses. So these two viruses will be quite different from each other in their behavior, the species that they affect and everything. So this is the kind of clustering that you do to identify uh, the proximity of different viruses. And this is the kind of study you do when there are subtle changes, even in the same strain of virus doing, like we are studying SARS coronavirus too, how it is moving from China to other parts of the world. How much is it changing and related to each other? Do you want to track uh, if a virus that entered a European country, where it came from? Did it come indirectly from a strain from United States or it came directly from China or some other part of the world? So those are the kind of things you do for these uh, phylogenetic analysis. Now here, this is just one example, how you align them. When you're aligning the sequence, you're pretty much aligning their function as well. So when you align the genomic sequence, you're aligning the uh, region that is coding for the spike glycoprotein. So you're aligning them together. And that's why even if there, there is a difference in the length of the genome, all these viruses may have different lengths of their RNA genome within human, within SARS coronavirus 2, the latest coronavirus, you might have variable length of the genome. But as long as you know, uh, as long as you can align these important structural marks, like these important regions coding for these important proteins, that helps you aligning them correctly and ignore the minor changes that happen in the length of the sequence. Now, this is just one of the publications, just to give you an example. Uh, I'm sure you can't read these names, so I'll do it for you. For example, here they try to look whether these viruses, viral strain in South Korea, uh, which country do they resemble? And they identified these viruses in the US. They have a close relationship to South Korean virus or virus in Beijing, a strain of virus in Beijing. Then say, for example, this strain. Here, another strain of virus from US has close relationship with France, a sequence obtained from Fr French samples or Singapore samples. So this is the kind of analysis that you do and try to build a story, try to build a phylogenetic chronological order of spread of the virus. This is just an example that I created to show like what kind of things you can do. So I looked at the Kerala uh, patients. Uh, this is just work in progress. So for example, you can look at this Kerala patient. I had two sequences. You look at one of them that is more close, closely resembling to the Wuhan viral genome that was submitted uh, on the public domain on 23rd December. Whereas the first patient, now the, these, both these patients were medical students from Wuhan. They both came from essentially the same city, but they already had subtle changes in the viral sequences that this one resembled the virus sequence that was submitted on 30th December. So this is the kind of relationship you can do. All these in red, they show the SARS coronavirus too. In the broader sense, you can match with the other coronavirus sequences to understand whether uh, like the knowledge that we have that it matches a certain strain of bat SARS like coronavirus. So that is the kind of information you get from these phylogenetic trees. This is just a linear form of looking at the same thing. These are the two patients similar to the Wuhan uh, uh, sequences. And this is what they base that information on that bat SARS like coronavirus is more closely related to the current outbreak, the entire red region, this entire sample, like these samples 
from SARS coronavirus too. They have close re resemblance to bat SARS like coronavirus. They are not, they are still uh, closely related, but not that closely related to the previous outbreak SARS coronavirus that are mentioned here. So this is a kind of analysis. Then you have to dig deeper and take the clinical features, integrate them with the viral sequence. And then you can look at more uh, uh, aspects of this, uh, such as infectivity, if certain mutation is making the virus more virulent. For that, you need to integrate the clinical feature with thousands of sequences and do an epidemiological association analysis. Now, this is one example from uh, an article in Fast Company uh, using the software Next Train. What they did is this. Uh, so I could not, uh, due to right protection, I could not upload the video here. But this kind of animated in an animated way shows the spread of different strains of viruses across the globe and from where it went in which direction based on just the evolution of the sequence. So you can go and check it out on uh, Fast Company. You can just search or I can share that article with you later. Now in India uh, at CCMB Hyderabad and IGIB New Delhi, they are leading uh, an effort, a large sequencing effort with the help under the uh, leadership of National Center for Disease Control New Delhi. What they're doing is they are collecting uh, strains from different parts of India and uh, uh, whole genome sequence them. And then they will compare those viral genomes and identify even if there are differences in strain, as Dr. S. G. Sir has raised that question, even outside of webinar, we keep discussing this aspect of it. So we have to identify which mutation is actually causing an impact, that that change in strain is actually significant, which change in strain is going to jeopardize our efforts to create new vaccine. Because vaccine, if it is targeting a moving target, it cannot work that way. Vaccines are very specific because they trigger antibody response and antibodies are very specific to a site. And if the target site changes, that virus cannot be attacked by those antibodies. So we have to keep track of these new strains, study them. And that's why I'm glad that in India, we have this concerted effort to sequence all these viral genomes and track their progress within India, because within India, a lot can happen in the next one year. And a vaccine developed based on sequences in the United States, quite possible, or Europe, quite possible that that won't work in India. So we need to have our own effort to develop these vaccine, vaccines that are effective in our population and in our strains of viruses that are uh, becoming endemic here. Now, these are the kind of studies you do. COVID-19 diagnosis, uh, uh, these we all know, the kind of symptoms that we see in a symptomatic patient, fever, hemoptosis, hemoptysis, cough, muscle pain, shortness of breath, pneumonia, and uh, there is an, uh, uh, more and more research on viral sepsis that uh, the SARS coronavirus is flooding the body with cytokines, with the inflammatory response. And that is what is triggering this widespread response across several systems, even if they're not getting affected directly by the virus, that exaggerated inflammatory response is causing the body to fail and not respond to treatments. So these are the varied symptoms. However, we have to remember that both symptomatic and asymptomatic coronavirus cases are contagious. Recently, a paper came out in which they even claimed that a patient with coronavirus is most contagious one day before that person becomes symptomatic. And the exact number they calculated was 0.7 days. That is less than one day before a patient became symptomatic. They were at the peak of viral shedding and spreading the virus. So that's a very concerning finding that, that came out a couple of days ago in that paper. And I hope that is not true, but it's a peer reviewed publication. So there is some truth to that and we have to confirm those findings. That's why countries that are only sequencing and testing symptomatic cases is not enough. We need to look at asymptomatic COVID-19 cases as well. Now the confirmatory test is a genetic one for coronavirus disease. What we do is real time reverse transcriptase uh, PCR or RRT-PCR. I know in general news, they just call it RT-PCR. That is slightly inaccurate because uh, just RT-PCR can mean reverse transcriptase PCR or real-time PCR. If you are talking about the combination of RT-QPCR, you also call it RRT-PCR. Now we have, for example, you need all these uh, things to conduct this test. I won't go much in detail. So all the necessary equipments to conduct the test, to protect the clinician or the lab technician, 
these are the combo kits that you have to order. For example, ICMR uh, approved this protocol and that uses TechPath COVID-19 combo kit. Then you need 250 microliters at least from the patient uh, specimen. And that has to have, if it's a corona positive patient, coronavirus positive, have enough concentration of the viral RNA material for RT-PCR to detect. If the sample is not collected properly, if it is not handled properly, and there is contamination or not enough concentration of the viral RNA in that sample, RT-PCR will fail or it won't work in an, at an optimal level. These are the various stages that you, uh, I won't go into details. Um, you clear the machine, you clear the sample uh, for next, uh, running the next sample by UNG incubation, uh, uracil and glycosidase. Then you do reverse transcribe to create cDNA from the single stranded RNA. Then you activate all the ingredients, all the reagents that you have, primers and probes. And with sequentially, uh, with, at various temperature, you run these annealing and extension cycles to make several copies of the viral RNA. At the same time, you are increasing the fluorescent signal. And when the fluorescent signal reaches a certain threshold, it detects the presence of coronavirus. So now, this is just a measure that uh, is used in uh, RT-PCR. We call it cycle threshold. So in real time, we are running several amplification cycles of the viral RNA. We are making several copies. With each copy, a certain amount of fluorescent signal is re released by the probe. And that, when crosses a threshold level of signal, that is a positive signal that COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 is present in that patient. Now, depending on the concentration, so by default, you have to, based on how much reagent you want to use in the test, you can only put certain amount of reagent mix in that experiment. So use like some use some sort of standard upper limit of how many amplification cycles you're going to run for that RT-PCR. It's usually 40 cycles, but uh, I see in that ICMR uh, website, I think they also allow 45 cycles. So you allow the number of cycles, enough number of cycles to amplify the viral RNA material so that it detects a positive response. More RNA concentration, more viral RNA you have, more viral load you have in that sample, uh, smaller will this number be. So CT cycle threshold, it will be shorter. So the signal will come earlier. So you won't have to go through the entire cycle. And that's how you monitor it in real time. Now, once you do that test, you get these kind of uh, uh, standard protocol tests. Uh, so now what RT-PCR does, you cannot sequence the entire genome. It takes more time. It requires more primers and probes and uh, a, a more expensive kit. And it will take more time to amplify the entire RNA genome. So what you want is you only want a very specific, a very sensitive test, a very sensitive test to presence of sars coronavirus 2 the latest sars coronavirus 2 not even the old one. Otherwise, you will assume it wrongly that the old sars coronavirus has come back again and causing an epidemic or pandemic. So you need to be very specific about this virus. So what you do is within these uh, gen uh, gene encoding regions, you only sequence the bits that are unique, unique sequences to this virus. And because there are frequent mutations and there are subtle mutations and that may affect the performance of your RT-PCR, you conduct that test in three different locations. So you get fluorescent signal from any of these sites. And based on that, if you have one positive signal, you say it is a positive uh, and you look at the controls and everything. And then you, based on that conclusion, if this control, uh, negative control, it should not give any positive signal. For example, you have nucleus free water that should not give you any DNA or RNA signal. So if that is positive, that's an invalid test. If you don't detect anything, uh, all three proteins, all three genes, do not give any fluorescent signal, then that's a valid test. And that person is tested negative because none of the sequence fragments are positive in that patient. If any one of them is positive, all of them are positive, you say it's positive, there's a typo here. Or if uh, only one or two out of three are positive, then you might have to repeat the test. Similarly, CDC has their own diagnostic panel from a different company. They have again, three regions that they test and uh, this RNSP is just to detect whether there is a biological, it was a correct biological sample. So this one is present in human cells, so it should come positive. If RNSP, the control uh, comes negative, then it's an invalid test. You did not collect the sample properly. Now, 
nasopharyngeal swab. So as you know, there are several sites, uh, several mucosal linings from where you can collect uh, SARS coronavirus uh, sample. However, the most optimum site based on the viral load and also on the practical aspect of it, feasibility of conducting mass tests, you want a site from where you can collect uh, enough, good enough RNA virus sample to test it with enough confidence. So nasopharyngeal swab is one, the most suitable and recommended region for these tests. And uh, I hope you hear the audio, but I'll share a video here to, uh, as you know, uh, these are expensive kits. And if you don't test properly, then you might not get the correct result and you don't want false positive or false negative. So there is a correct way of collecting uh, the sample and I'll briefly go through it. So this is the recommendation guideline published by... So uh, let me ask first, uh, can you hear the audio? Could you hear the audio? No. Yes, sir. You could hear the audio from the slide, right? No, we couldn't. No, okay, no. Okay, so then I will narrate along with it. So this is uh, provided, like standard protocol provided by New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, they recently published a standard way of conducting it. So they published a video with this article where you, how to collect it and in what cases you should be careful. Now, now this is the swab that you insert inside the nasopharynx. And I'm uh, skipping through the video to go to the relevant bits. So this is the collection kit and you're taking the nasopharyngeal swab. But you have to be careful while inserting it. If there is nasal trauma or surgery, the markedly deviated septum, then you might, or chronic uh, block nasal passage or bleeding disorders, you might injure the inner mucosal lining of the patient and you don't want to do that. Now, this is the tip of the swab uh, collecting kit and uh, uh, they will show how to prepare for it. So first is how to prepare the clinician. They have to wear the protective kit in a very specific manner. So as you can see, they have uh, the person has worn a disposable PPE, a protective kit. Then they will sanitize their hands before touching any more equipments. And after that, you touch the gloves. You don't touch them with contaminated hands. And then with those clean gloves, you touch the face mask. And there is a specific way of sealing it. Then you wear the protective visor, the plastic uh, transparent visor in front of you. Remember to label the sample correctly and at the right time before you collect it so that you don't forget. And after that, let's look at the procedure. You tell the patient to remove the mask. The patient leaves the mask on during this preparation. You don't want them to infect the area. So you want Not them to keep wearing it. mask until it is necessary uh, to remove it. After that, you tilt the head a little bit. You tilt the patient's head. What that does, it opens the nasopharyngeal route. So it makes the entry possible to go all the way back to the nasopharynx of the patient. So if you find any obstruction, any hindrance in entering that probe in that uh, swab, you take it out and try again and make sure that you're doing it gently without hurting the mucosa. And when it is inserted to a proper full length, you will see that it is touching the back of the pharynx. And this is the nasopharyngeal region where it goes. After it has reached, you have to leave it over there for at least eight seconds. You have to leave it so that it absorbs the mucosal secretion in that area. Some clinicians also advise to rotate the swab. As you saw, the uh, clinician sp uh, spun the swab a bit so that you can cover all the uh, linings and collect enough sample. After that, you put it in the test tube, you break the tip, and then you enclose it. This is kind of the way you have to collect it. Uh, some articles suggest that you have to spin the uh, swab and touch the mucosa until there is teary eye, like the patient has teary eyes. So that's kind of the thing that patient is uncomfortable. That means you have reached the nasopharynx. I am not sure if that is necessary, but make sure that it reaches till the end and you spin the swab and you keep it there for eight seconds before you take it out so that you ensure that enough RNA material has been collected from the patient sample. 
after that you discard the disposable ppe along with the gloves as you know as you can see they discarded everything together clean sanitize your hands again before removing the other things from your face this is kind of the end of it i will uh, just skip the video till the end there was a brief summary over it doing the same thing but let's skip that and i it's an nagm article you saw the name and recording is on youtube so you we can go and go back to the article and uh, read about it as well with that uh, i would like to thank you for your time i hope uh, this uh, uh, webinar was uh, helpful to you and if there are any questions you can either ask here if you run out of time you can send your questions in an email at this uh, the following address if you have any other queries you can email us as well thank you very much um thank you dr anshuman we have about 4 minutes left and i apologize for a little delay in the beginning and you know maybe take uh, one or two questions if um, you know is is that okay with all of um, you sir um, and uh, dr anshuman sure sure absolutely yeah so um, i think it was a, a great um, way to understand um, you know the genome and the sequence and how actually it attaches um some of the questions that have been um very um you know keenly asked is in terms of um, you know are, are the strains very different uh, i request others to please um, you know switch off and mute their uh, microphone thank you and uh, say for example um, you know in terms of uh, cambridge study the phylogenetic analysis of sars covid 2 virus uh, predominantly uh, found three strains type a type b uh, and type c and which is the strain which is in india and what is its virulence uh, you have to unmute your mic anshuman hello hello yeah. i'm sorry so uh, as i mentioned uh, thank you for that question it's a very good question so as you know we are tracking the phylogenetics of these viruses and trying to identify the origin because that's going to be not just a medical challenge a regulatory challenge when we are locking down the boundary for one country or the other from where the strain is coming and all that so now that study that you're talking about uh, mention uh, i believe uh, three uh, groups of strains type a b and c and uh, type a they have mentioned that it originated from wuhan and it went to united states another strain that they talked about uh, the group of strains that they talked about was type b and uh, that went to east asia if you know the first case that happened outside china was in thailand so the first the second type of strain that went was to east asia but it did not spread anywhere after that because of their prompt lockdown in those east asian countries and uh, a type c is suspected to uh, go to european countries france italy uh, sweden england in all those places so these strains are different from each other how different in terms of virulence we have for that we have to link the sequences with the functional impact so we have to look at the clinical impact of each strain now for structural study for molecular study we have to look at the molecular level how different these proteins are how different spike protein is from one strain to the other and has that mutation increased or decreased the affinity of that strain of virus towards that receptor because if it has made it more uh, increase the affinity of that strain of virus uh, that mutation has increased the affinity of that strain of virus that means it is more uh, readily attaching to the mucosal surface it is more aggressive it will infect more readily however the mutation if it has distorted the spike protein for example in such a way that it can no longer bind to the ace2 receptor that means it has reduced the virulence of that strain so it depends it's a very challenging question uh, viruses because of first of all they are single strand rnas and also they are kind of they live on the host cell on their own they are not even considered living they are just a collection of rna material to infect host cell so they need that machinery so they don't have that sophisticated machinery to control the mutation rate and that's why these viruses have very high mutation rate so they mutate quite easily however as i mentioned these mutations not all of them are significant so we have to study at the molecular and lab level to do functional studies to identify their virulence and also 
combine this data with the clinical information from each of these countries and look at the impact of each mutation and change of strain on the clinical prognosis of uh, uh, COVID-19. Okay. And uh, I understand you also need a lot more cases and um, really look at that. Uh, there are a number of um, questions on uh, ACE2 um, receptor. Uh, so one person uh, has asked if, uh, you know, in terms of, um, you know, it's, is it going to be in the respiratory tract, uh, GI everywhere, it's, it has a affinity or how do we really uh, see that? And related to it is another question uh, with reference to uh, what happens if, um, you know, somebody is um, hypertensive and taking uh, telomeritin and 40 ounce uh, daily, because this may have, um, at this drug increases this uh, ACE2 receptor, um, you know, capability. So, um, you know, how do we really answer those two? And one more question with related to that is, um, you know, if uh, a person is infected with, uh, you know, uh, this coronavirus uh, recovered, uh, can he be infected again? Okay. Thank you for that question. Yes, that's a very good question. ACE2 inhibitor is the one that we know from SARS coronavirus from 2003, as well as this one, that that is the receptor that these viruses target. Now, that is one of the site, one of the receptor site that we know in the host cell that is used by this virus. However, we are constantly, uh, scientists are constantly looking at, are there any other receptors that are recognized by, by these spike proteins? Is it necessarily just these mucosal cells that I had mentioned that are getting infected? Because that kind of localizes the impact of this virus to those sites and to those systems. But are they infecting other sites as well? Uh, for example, recently, uh, uh, it has been hypothesized that T cells, the T cell count is decreasing in corona patients. Now, is that happening like HIV where the T cell is getting attacked? Or is that because of just during the immune response, T cells are getting overwhelmed by the infection and the count is depleting. So we don't know uh, whether it is directly attaching to the T cells. So there is, there is constantly this research ongoing on all the receptors, all the cell surfaces that this virus is affecting or infecting or attaching itself to. So that is one. So ACE2 inhibitor is a well-known one, but you also need the other TMPRSS2 that I mentioned. So you need these two to successfully infect a cell. Now, as I mentioned, one more thing is viral sepsis. The overwhelming amount of cytokine response, the immunological response by these viral in response to this infection. And what that does, it, an overall septic attack happens. The entire body, all the system, the entire immune response is overwhelmed by the infection, the increase in infection, increase in severity of this infection and compromised uh, uh, systems, respiratory systems and digestive system. Now, because of that, that cytokine flooding, uh, again, uh, I would like to mention that it's an ongoing research. So these are some of the things that are coming up. So this cytokine overwhelm can actually have a septic response for the entire body and worsen a patient prognosis quite drastically. So these are some of the things, T cell, cytokine uh, levels, and all this immunological response, how patients are behaving in response to several treatments. Uh, if they are non-responsive to certain treatments. So we don't know yet which drug works for sure. For example, hydroxychloroquine. Initially, we thought it's going to be, it's very effective in treating these patients. United States asked to uh, like massive batches of this drug so that they can import and use it. Now it's coming out. Some studies are suggesting that it's not that effective. However, it does uh, reduce the symptomatic uh, severity in these patients by reducing the inflammation. So these are the things we are learning as we go at a very rapid pace, considering it's such a fast spreading pandemic, there is a concerted response uh, to identify and get more details about all the receptors, drugs, and vaccine targets. Now coming to the antihypertensive, I would advise everyone and anyone who is taking these antihypertensives, antidiabetics, or any medications, do not stop medication on your own. Consult with your family physician, consult with the doctor, whether you should stop taking a certain drug. Because there are other ways this virus can infect. You don't want that you uh, avoided the viral infection, but because of avoiding a medication, 
you fell or succumbed to another uh, this thing or you worsened your health condition because of not taking your drugs regularly so do not self medicate and do not stop medication on your own that is one advice i would like to give uh, stay up to date with the news uh, all the medications and all the developments that are happening and consult with your doctor or uh, any media that you can ask questions to go to who websites cdc website and stay up to date with what is happening uh, regarding this pandemic because this has never happened before reinfection now that is one interesting thing because there was sudden increase in cases in china and they were wondering whether it's a new infection new spread travelers coming from outside china and uh, new cases have come up whether that is the case one possibility could be uh, they are getting instead of reinfection maybe they got discharged too soon as you know the healthcare system is so burdened with, with the number of patients that are uh, coming in for example in italy they are choosing which patient to save older patient is allowed to die when they are short of ventilator and they are choosing the younger patient these are the tough choices so we have limited resources at the hospital and because of that it is quite possible in some places that discharging patients too soon and the virus was not successfully cleared and the it just reappeared and reinfected the same person so that is one more thing second possibility is maybe they got infected with a different strain however if you live in the same neighborhood if you live in the same neighborhood and you are in lockdown you are not interacting with new people the likelihood is very low that you are getting in contact with a new strain that is viable enough out of all the low probabilities of having another virulent different strain getting in contact with another totally different strain like that so it's a challenging question again we have to monitor the situation look at these patients uh we need to have the sequence of the old viral strain from that patient and compare it with the reinfection what this new virus looks like is it the same infection coming back or it's a new strain okay. um thank you there are many more questions i i will sir i will just give you one question um you know i'm from kerala in kolikode uh, district a person was detected positive after 28 days um how was this possible and um, over to dr gupta sir and we had a good experience of zika in our state particularly in chembur so in october november 2018 the uh, zika virus disease got inroads into jaipur okay sir uh, about the zika virus as well as um, you know can it be positive after 28 days uh, sir sdg sir okay um maybe uh, he is not able to hear so, so maybe, maybe i can answer that uh, briefly yeah. so uh, the spec sure so the uh, range uh, for a person to test positive from asymptomatic to symptomatic it ranges up to 4 weeks the minimum is they can get symptomatic within 2 days and uh, the median time is around 5 or 6 days the lockdown period and everything is designed around 14 days so that's kind of like the majority of it but this 28 days again we have to go to the travel history exposure history and uh, investigate more that were they in contact with another infected person within those 28 days or was it actually 28 days so yes that's a good question and i would like i would have to look into that uh, look at that case specific case and then i'll be able to answer more specifically sir i have one question also yeah can i just um, you know Uh, we are just running out of time uh, there are a lot of other uh, questions that are coming by sure. um, and uh, just one uh, which is little different maybe you want to uh, see somebody has asked uh, can you please let us know uh, where we can get the strains to plan our study and um, you know so uh, you know in specific ways uh, how maybe uh, the people and the audience who are there um, can connect to you for you know guidance on uh, studies and how to collaborate and other things maybe that would be a um, good question sure sure uh, so we welcome all the collaborators uh, 
one of the objectives of these webinars is to connect with our scientific community so that we can work together in a collaborative manner and deal with this pandemic uh, as quickly as possible. And for that, uh, as uh, Dr. Manjunath mentioned, we need a lot of samples and we need a lot of sequences to have enough statistical power for this. So, and we need samples from various populations. So different states and not just one or two states that won't work because this is a pandemic. People are traveling from one state to the other freely within India. So we need to collaborate and work together. I had mentioned uh, it's a YouTube recording. You can see my email. You can contact IHMR Bangalore. Uh, my email is anshuman at ihmr.edu.in. Um, or you can just look me up. I think Google has made it quite easy nowadays. So you can just look up my name and find me and I'm always responsive to any collaborative opportunities. And we can work together on writing multi-center proposals, multi-state proposals, funding proposals. And uh, given the situation, government is quite responsive. They are quite prompt in funding these kind of projects that can help them deal with it. So we can write a proposal in collaboration uh, decide on collection sites from where to collect patient data, patient samples, and have a unified, a uniform, a single site where we can deposit them and get them sequenced. There are several locations in Delhi. Then there is National Institute of Virology. Uh, initially, I mentioned ICMB and other institutes that are already trying to work on it and uh, collect enough samples, but I think it will require more than just one or two institutes. So let's all work together. Uh, send an email to me, Dr. Manjunath, Dr. SD Gupta, and just, just uh, we are open to all collaboration opportunities. Yeah, just uh, because we just started with, uh, I think, uh, Baswa Prabhu, maybe just I'll take one question from him directly. Because uh, there are many questions, I'm sorry. I mean, we okay. kind of got delayed. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Uh, I have one question, sir, that if virus is continuously mutating, then what is the fate of vaccine development or a kind of things? Because we need a particular region with it's a constant region we need. But what's the fate if it is continuously, uh, you know, uh, replicating, then it's continuously mutating, like, pro uh, although probability or rate of mutation is less in case of this virus, but uh, there is a mutation as I studied. So what is the fate of this? Because when we when we start if a part is immunogenic so that may different if it is getting continuously replic uh, mutating so that epitope part will also be getting right that's changed. an excellent question uh, that's an excellent question uh, thank you for that i think it's a good last question to conclude because that is where we are heading the vaccine development so uh, i'll start with one thing you're right and i'll start with one thing that uh, bill gates is funding seven di different vaccine production units seven different factories. And he is addressing the concern that you and I both have is that constant mutation. Vaccine, as you know, it triggers antibody response and it targets a specific protein or particle of the virus. And it generates a very specific antibody population in the blood and that can attack the next infection. As you yeah. rightly mentioned, if virus is constantly mutating, uh, how can we target a moving, like it's a moving target. How do we target it? And that's a valid question. And that is what the concern is because vaccine development takes 12 to 18 months to commercialize and put it out in the market. And what if in that time, another strain of coronavirus became prevalent in the population, in the society, started infecting, it is still infectious, but at the same time, it is not getting recognized uh, by the antibodies because the vaccine is triggering some old strain and that is yeah, a very absolutely. valid question and that's a very concerning thing and that is in fact the truth and that's why we hope that vaccine development happens quickly another thing that bill gates is doing why he's funding seven vaccine programs together because you cannot work in sequence you cannot develop vaccine against one strain and then when that strain starts failing that vaccine starts failing you start developing the second vaccine based on the second strain so these seven vaccine development programs at the same time are going to look at seven most prevalent viral strains across the globe and simultaneously develop vaccine against each of those prevalent strains. As you know, not all mutations uh, lead to a structural change in the protein. Not all mutations lead to the same virulent strain. Sometimes they render that strain ineffective, harmless. So hopefully uh, that will be the case. And hopefully 
no more than seven strains will become prevalent in the population otherwise it's a nightmare it's already it already is because of the timeline that we have but uh, let's hope these vaccines are effective another thing one more relevant point i would like to point out as you know we have flu shots every year they have flu vaccine they give flu vaccine however that flu vaccine the exact strain that is targeted by them is revised at least once a year because of this constant mutation viral strains are changing even for those common flu they are not fatal but it's still important and that's the challenge you have to keep developing new vaccine every year for these viruses and that is going to be the case uh, in this sars cov2 we will have to constantly be on top of it keep identifying new strains and develop new vaccines once we have the infrastructure for those seven main strains once you have the infrastructure in set uh, for a particular strain it's relatively faster to modify a vaccine okay. it is a challenge to start with the first vaccine that works because we don't want patient to be infected with a virulent particle a strain of vaccine that is harmless uh, that that is harmful to the patient so the first few trials are a challenge once you have the infrastructure in place modifying a vaccine would be relatively faster i'm not saying it will be a magic uh, but it will be a little easier so thank you for that question okay like, excuse okay. me can i help yeah hello excuse me ma'am uh, yeah i think um, i think i'll have to call it off we are already uh, extended by you know we started out maybe about 8 minutes late but we are 10 minutes beyond the time but what i will ask dr deepa uh, to do is she has collected all the questions uh, you can send more and uh, we will share it with him and make a group of uh, the people who participated and share the answers because we can probably classify all of them and uh, overall i think uh, you know because like he said um, you know we don't get all the answers uh, within one session right now and also i think the idea that uh, dr anshuman said about collaborating and uh, i understand we have um, you know various professionals across from medical doctors to um, you know technologists and uh, you know uh, microbiologists and a whole lot of people in this uh, group and uh, the collaborative work and the idea that he told about uh, the seven strains in the vaccines to be uh, done um, is is a very great one so i think uh, continuing uh, this uh, kind of a discussion um, and maybe having a, a group once he answers we will all uh, share it with you and here uh, with dr gupta with me or with directly with um, dr anshuman i think uh, we should um, continue um, you know what i started off as uh, science and research i think uh, uh, this is where we probably will be able to really uh, conquer of course there could be something else after um, uh, you know the and corona but then uh, this is where um, the human uh, you know mind and the research in terms of uh, really finding and going to the depth is all about and uh, so it's been a, a wonderful participation from your end i think uh, dr uh, sd gupta sir has left he probably has to attend one more meeting um i um, you know thank him i thank um, uh, dr anshuman of course i thank my team but most importantly the number of people who responded to this and who have been uh, with um, us for the last more than 90 minutes now it's been a wonderful um, you know discussion that we have had and we will continue to work together maybe collaborate and uh, really take uh, this forward because uh, like he said um you know the the end is not in september the end is not in uh, december so it is going to be much longer so in this journey of research and this new to work thank you all Once again uh, dr anshuman and uh, thank you dr manjunath i would like to uh, take a moment to quickly thank you for organizing uh, uh, such a great webinar where so many people connected your marketing team has to be thanked for gathering so many people so many people yes. from all across yes. india and thank you for giving me this opportunity to uh, share whatever yes. i learned thank you yes so when we heard uh, dr anshuman on our uh, ihma group uh, this when i said no no we have to take this forward uh, we have to uh, open it up for everyone and so for the last one week uh, my team has worked with dr anshuman dr sdg and of course the marketing team and the technology team uh, everyone and uh, 
stay safe and um, you know all the physical distancing the hygiene and continues even after the lockdown goes down um, so um, so let's all be safe and of course uh, when things are not very well known maybe we pray and we say well you know um, there is something more a different force which will probably work but i'm sure we will overcome this and uh, thank you all have a great evening bye bye now thank you bye bye